Good morning and a very warm welcome to our service on Sunday the 28th of June. It is a very warm welcome at the moment, it's a very hot day and so we've come into church for a little bit of cool air this morning. You will know that the government guidelines have changed again this week from the 4th of July and we are looking at all of those and planning ahead. What we hope to be able to do in this coming week is to open for private prayer. We can only do that with the help of volunteers to be in the church, to clean and to help those people that come in to be safe in what they do. Paul is putting together a rotor at the moment for us to be able to cover this and there are two slots that we're hoping to be able to open for. The first one is on a Thursday night from five o'clock to nine o'clock. The second slot is a Friday morning from 10 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock. If you are able to cover any of those slots, then please let Paul know over the coming weeks uh, and we'd be re really delighted to have as many people as possible uh, covering these shifts to help each other out and to enable us to open just a little bit at this time. If you are in one of the government shielded groups in any way, shape or form, please don't ask us if you can help because we will have to say no, I'm really sorry. You will also know that the government have confirmed that from the 4th of July we could open for worship. You will also know from all that we've said so far that we are not able to do that at the moment. The Church of England fully support that decision knowing that each and every church has very different circumstances. We are looking at all the guidelines that are coming out, all the guidance, we are filling in the risk assessments and we obviously want to open as soon as we can but we will only do that when it is as safe to open as we can do. I hope that whatever you've done this week, you've had a good week, that you've enjoyed some of the sun again and the very warm weather. Thank you to everybody who prayed with us on Wednesday night. It's really wonderful that we can come together and pray together, even when we can't actually be together. So thank you for praying, maybe through the prayer points, perhaps praying through something else that God laid on your heart. But thank you so much. It was great to be together on Wednesday evening. This coming week we have our youth group on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. If you know a young person who would like an invitation to that, then please let me know. Uh, and we'd be delighted to welcome them into our Zoom youth group on Tuesday. As we go into our service this morning, let's just take a moment of quiet and then let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that on this Sunday morning, as we come to worship you, you are with us in our homes, in our gardens, wherever we are watching this from, you are there. And as you are with us, you bring us together as your body. Even when we cannot physically be together, we can share in worship together. We pray this morning for our brothers and sisters around the world. For those people facing many different challenges today in terms of COVID, in terms of the resources that they have. Father, we pray again, as we did in May, that your kingdom will come in this world. As we worship you this morning, help us to lift our heart to you, to lift our eyes to you and to lift all that we are to worship you. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. And so we have our reading done by Kath. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women, and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And beside him 
stood Mattahiah, Shema, Anahiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masahiah on his right hand, and Pedahiah, Mishael, Malkajah, Hashem, Hashbadaniah, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbathiah, Hoda, Masahiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jezebad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people understand the law, while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The Festival of Booths Celebrated On the second day, the heads of ancestral houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to the scribe Ezra in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should live in booths during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their towns and in Jerusalem as follows. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them, and made booths for themselves on each of the roofs of their houses and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim and all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them for from the days of Jeshua son of Nun to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. COVID-19 has shone a light on how unequal our world really is. For many people around the world, lockdowns have meant cramped living conditions, loss of jobs, increasing debt and days without food. And it's reminded us of how we've damaged God's creation. Air pollution has made people more vulnerable and our destruction of nature has made it more likely for diseases to jump species. But as we've journeyed through this crisis, three big positive shifts in society have also started to happen. The first is a shift away from individualism. We live side by side, but separate from each other. Now we found greater togetherness. 
Even though we're physically distanced, we're coming together as communities. Local communities are supporting each other in WhatsApp groups and mutual aid, and we've seen how thousands of key workers bravely hold our society together. The second shift has been valuing life more than productivity. So often our value has been defined by what we have or how productive we are. But now dignity of life for everyone is top of the agenda. So much of the economy has been put on pause to protect people's health. People who are homeless have been housed and millions of us are giving our time and resources to support the most vulnerable. And lastly, there's a shift towards greater imagination. In a poll during April, only 9% of Britons wanted life to return to normal after lockdown. We're discovering how much is possible. We've built new hospitals in days. We've seen unprecedented government support and a world change overnight. Now more than ever, people are hoping that the world really will change for the better. But this change is not guaranteed to last. If we don't act, we could easily fall back to the old normal. Or we could go in a worse direction, where the lockdowns result in racism and division, inequality gets worse and public money is used to bail out big polluting companies. But if we embrace these three big shifts towards togetherness, life and imagination, we could see real change. The reboot of the economy could fast track action on the climate emergency, protect the most vulnerable and reduce inequality. This just might be possible if we take action together. In his Easter sermon, Archbishop Justin Welby said, after so much suffering, so much heroism from key workers and the NHS, we cannot be content to go back to what was before as if all is normal. There needs to be a resurrection of our common life. As the people of God, we can be a part of casting a vision for a way forward. How will you play your part? Thank you to Kath for doing our reading this morning. I did give her a rather challenging one and she did amazingly. So thank you, Kath, for doing our reading today. And so let us pray. Loving God, as we hear your word this morning, open our hearts and minds to see what you are saying to us. Help us to read the signs of the time, to think how we can rebuild and repurpose to go forward in your name. Open our eyes and open our ears now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It would be really great this morning if you had a Bible available. It's lovely that I'm seeing some of the things that people are doing in the services in journaling Bibles. Uh, please keep, keep pushing those onto Facebook. because It's lovely to see what you are being spoken to during our talks in this season. We have just watched a short video. It's a video which talks about some of the outcomes of coronavirus. Many of these outcomes we don't actually know at the moment, but we know that there are some good things among all the really awful things that are coming out of this virus. The good that is going on in our change towards the environment, in our way that we're thinking about others. And so today we're going to think about rebuilding, about repurposing, but also looking at the signs of the times and how do we interpret these in the midst of this virus and this pandemic at this time. Over the last few weeks, we've thought about the Israelites. We've thought about the exile and we thought about how the prophets spoke into these times. Last week, Simon spoke to us about the parables and how we should see ourselves in these stories as we read them and interpret them in these times. I think that at present it's possible to see ourselves in many of the different Bible passages as we read them. As we hear of things happening in previous times, we can relate ourselves to those. As I was thinking last week about this talk, about this reading, I myself joined in, as much as you can do in these times, with a funeral of a very dear friend of mine. I was incredibly sad not to be able to be there, but such are our times at the moment. As I read some of these passages from the Old Testament about the exile, I somehow feel I can understand some of their loss and their bereavement through some of the things that we are facing at this time. 
Later in the week last week, I joined in a diocesan-wide meeting, which was helping us to think and reflect on what is going on, to think about what has been our experience, to think what passages of scripture, parts of the Bible have spoken to us and are speaking to us at the moment. And then to start to think, where do we go with all of these? It was a really interesting meeting to be part of and to listen to what other people were saying. Last Sunday morning before our service, I was sitting and reading the Bible. And it was a passage before the chapter and the verses that Simon used last Sunday that I happened to be reading. I know our reading this morning is Nehemiah, but I'm just going to move away from that for a few minutes to read Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to the end. I am reading from the Passion Translation. I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I long for every heart to be already ablaze with this fiery passion for God. Don't we just wish to see that in this time? But first, I must be immersed into the baptism of God's judgment. I am consumed with passion as I await its fulfilment. Don't think for a moment that I came to grant you peace, harmony to everyone. No, for my coming will change everything and create hostility among you. From now on, even family members will be divided over me and will choose sides against one another. Fathers will be split off from sons, and sons against fathers. Mothers will be against daughters, and daughters against mothers. Mothers Mothers-in-law will be against brides, and brides against mother-in-laws, all because of me. Jesus then said to the crowd gathered around him, When you see a cloud forming in the west, don't you say a storm is brewing? and then it arrives. And when you feel the south wind blowing, you say a heat wave is on the way. And so it happens. What hypocrites. You are such experts at forecasting the weather, but you are totally unwilling to understand the spiritual significance of the time you're living in. You can't even judge for yourselves what is good and right. When you are wrong, it is better that you agree with your adversary and settle your dispute before you have to go before a judge. If not, you may be dragged into court and the judge may find you guilty and throw you into prison until you have paid off your fine entirely. I think these are incredibly powerful verses. And as I read them last weekend, it took me back to my curacy, which was my training period. And many of you will know, we spent our time then in very rural Shropshire, and we lived in a very small village. And I was constantly amazed at the weather in that place. We were in the Shropshire hills, we had hills all around us. And I would watch, and I would look at the weather that was coming. I would wait for it to arrive with us, but it never did. I met many farmers during my time in Shropshire. They could always tell me what the weather that we could see would do. And we had a really weird ecosystem where we were. A lot of the weather would pass over and go to a different place. I never really understood a lot of the weather until at the end of my time there and talking to these farmers who knew the times and knew the weather and how to read that. This reading from Luke speaks into our times. It speaks of being unable to understand the spiritual significance of the times that we're in. The Passion Translation uses the word unwilling to understand. I have had many conversations over the last few days and weeks and months with people about what is going on in these times. I've had people thinking that we are in end times, which in some way we always are. I've had people who have read back into other situations and gone, well, it's like this, isn't it? We can relate to those Israelites that we've thought about in the exile. We can relate to them before that as they wandered for 40 years. When they were in the exile, they were separated from God and all that they knew of their home and their life. And perhaps today we can also relate into the early church 
to those first disciples trying to make sense of the situation they're in during Jesus' death, his resurrection, his ascension, and then the Holy Spirit coming on them. We need to know our history as Christians. We need to know our history as people. We need to understand some of this to know where we're going. Sometimes walking away from the things that have been wrong. The Black Lives Matter movement is highlighting huge amounts of wrongdoing that have gone on. The Windrush scandal, which I think has been an anniversary this week. Again, we have done wrong to many people. The abuse of children and young people in so many different walks of life, but very, very sadly also including the church. We need to learn from huge mistakes in our society and in our church. We need to walk away from cover-ups and aim to do so much better in the future, to look after each and every one of God's children. Sometimes we might ourselves need to learn a pattern that we get ourselves into. We need to recognise that we do something in a particular way and we don't always recognise our actions being repeated. We need to know that this is not a right action for us in our Christian life and to know that God has a far better way for us. As we're alive this morning, we all have a past. We all have things that we've done right and that we've done wrong. Some of us get used to doing some of those things wrong repeatedly and don't ever be challenged on it. But we can be people who use what we have lived for. People who have survived through many different things to navigate the season that we are in today. What have we learnt about the way God works? And how can we see that playing out in this time and in this season? So let's move on to look at this chapter from Nehemiah. We're going to think about the whole book of Nehemiah, but that would have taken a very long time to read that this morning. But I think it's such an amazing story. It shows the difference that one person really can make. At the start of the book of Nehemiah, we are again back in that exile period, and Nehemiah is in Babylon, acting as the cupbearer to the king. Basically, he gets to serve wine to the king and gets to taste it to make sure it's not poisoned. I'm guessing there might be a line-up for that kind of job. We're probably in the times round about 440 to 430 BC, so we are 150 years on from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. If you go back to the start of Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah hears that news that Jerusalem has been broken down and the gates destroyed. We find that Nehemiah's response to this is one of absolute grief. He doesn't hear the news and think, okay, fair enough, that's happened. He weeps, he mourns, he fasts, he prays before the God of heaven. What an amazing response. How often do we take our problems, our sadness and our difficulty straight to God? To weep, to confess our failure to bring everything before the God of heaven. I suspect our problems may not be quite so heavy if we did that. Nehemiah pours out his sadness to God. He says, we have offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes and the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah is recognising some of the signs of the times of the things that he is hearing, and he turns to God in prayer and in grief and in sorrow. And his sorrow doesn't leave him there, as our problems come into every day with us. Nehemiah carried this into his work. We can all put on the act and going, yeah, I'm fine, thank you very much. But this was not a time to be okay. Nehemiah's homeland had been destroyed. The king inquires when he sees Nehemiah on one day what the matter may be. And Nehemiah tells him why he is so unhappy. He tells the story of the walls in Jerusalem. The king asks Nehemiah, what do you request? And Nehemiah's answer in chapter 2 is immediately to pray to the God of heaven. After prayer, Nehemiah asks the king, 
that he may return to the city of his ancestors' graves. He wants to go to Judah and he wants to rebuild. The king agrees, and not only that, he sends him with letters to get through to different provinces, to get through different provinces. He gives him the materials that he might need to rebuild. And so Nehemiah went. I've not been able to find a definitive figure of how far Jerusalem and Babylon were apart, but we're looking round about, I think, about a thousand miles, quite a journey to undertake. But Nehemiah had listened to God and he went. His journey was not smooth sailing. He met with two governors, Tobiah and Sambalat, and they were less than happy that someone cared about Jerusalem and about its people. Nehemiah faced much opposition from those who did not like what he wanted to do, but he trusted again and again in God. The walls were rebuilt in a space, a time of space, a time space, sorry, of less than six months. No wonder people were fearful of what happened as these walls went up amidst these oppositions and these threats. In chapter 7, we hear that the exiles are returning. And then we come to our reading today in chapter 8. As all the people gather within these new walls, in their home city, they are together again. So much has changed in their fortune. And we're told the people gathered as one man. Please take the times into account at this point. They gathered in the square before the water gate. And Ezra, a contemporary of Nehemiah who wrote the book before Nehemiah, is told to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord commanded to Israel. Think back to the start of Nehemiah and that chapter one, to the prayers and to the pleadings, where he said to God, we have offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes and the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. Here, the time has come to bring this book back that God gave his people, to bring it back into the centre of their lives, into their minds and to their actions. Perhaps this is a season for us, where the word of God becomes our life force. Perhaps we've forgotten the power that is in this very book. Perhaps we've forgotten all that we know about God as we're tossed around by the storms of life and by the weirdness of this world. This took a personal commitment, a communal commitment as well, as to how they were going to live their lives going forward. As I've been thinking about this reading over the last couple of weeks, the word that keeps coming back to me is the word repurposed. In Nehemiah, these people had forgotten their lifeblood, the very word of God, and perhaps we have too. Perhaps we've made church so complicated. Perhaps we've made our own personal faith a place where we're jumping through hoops for God rather than sitting in his presence and enjoying time with him. Maybe we've put up obstacles for others or for ourselves because actually we're all living through the grace of God, through the mercy and the love of God. Perhaps there is something for us to do in confession today. And when we can meet again together, I have no doubt that we will need to think about what we do and why we do it afresh. But I think we have a chance and an opportunity to be repurposed, not for, for our own will, but to follow in what God is doing today, in the coming days and weeks and months. We're already looking at new purposes for our building, to be able to grow and extend the facilities we have so that we can open our building to the homeless, so that we can extend our provision for youth and children's work. But what else is God asking us to do in this season? The people were helped to understand what was being said to them in this reading. And it was so powerful, they worshipped God and they wept and they heard the word of the law. We need to respond to God's word. It is a powerful living word. 
And there are certainly times to weep and to mourn, to be sorry for what we have done. But here Nehemiah tells the people not to be grieved. And the reason is that verse from Nehemiah 8, verse 10, which tells us today and told those who return to their city that the joy of the Lord is your strength. In this sadness, in this mourning, as people come back knowing that many of those who went to Babylon have of course not come back because they've died there. But still there is a joy as they again understand the time that they're in. They understand the words that are being said to them and they set themselves again to walk in the way of the law that they heard and to worship God and to serve him. They rediscover things about their faith, about their celebrations. And one of the things that I love in this chapter is that in the midst of all that's going on that we've heard about so far, in verse 10, when they're told to go and eat the fat and drink sweet wine, they are also told to send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. There is social justice in these times back then, as well as today. To look out for those who might not have the resources to celebrate, to gather together and have a feast. This is a communal celebration. And all, no matter what they have or may not have, are part of this and should be welcomed into this celebration, this communal act of faith, as these people find again their purpose, find God in their midst, and they vow to follow it this way. I think that we are being repurposed as well as a community within this village of Yaxley. It is something that we will need to do when we come together, to remember those with and those without. And we are very likely going to be in a season where many more are without. We have an amazing food bank. We have people who all through this pandemic have come and served in this building to serve people who don't have enough at this time. Simon and I have had days when we can barely get out over our doorstep because the amount of food that people have donated is just so much and that is wonderful and please continue to do that. But what else are we being asked to do? Community and communal purpose is vital. We'll need to think hard about the whys, the whats and the hows. We need to be understanding the spiritual significance of the time that we are living in, the time that we are working out our purpose from. However, we need to be thinking about our own purpose within God's story. I'm not just talking about your gifts and skills, although we want to be using everything that every person brings. But where are you going to position yourself at this time? If we are being repurposed, then where can you best serve God? Perhaps in your work, perhaps in your home, perhaps at play. Those people that had returned to Jerusalem knew that they had to get down on their knees. They had to express their sadness and their grief. But then they had to get up and celebrate all that God had done and was still doing for them. Take some time before life speeds up again too much to maybe grieve the things that you have lost in this time, to bring them to God. And like the king that Nehemiah says, like the king that Nehemiah served, says, what do you request? Ask that of God and ask that of you and maybe you'll be amazed at what is said. We continue to try and understand the spiritual significance of this time. We know that many things are happening. There's a softening of people's hearts and minds towards God, towards us as Christians. We know that people have a new curiosity and are turning to searches on prayer. We know that from that video, that things are changing for our world, our climate, our church and ourselves. Where will you position yourself in your own walk with God? Perhaps sometimes on your knees, perhaps sometimes with your arms raised in praise, 
but always trying to be in step with our God who is faithful. Those people who arrived back in Jerusalem had to think about where they had come from, about where they were now, and using all of this to look at the signs, to repurpose their own lives, to repurpose their own community and to set them back in step with God, to think how were they going to live their lives differently. They had choices as we do today. How are we going to repurpose our lives? How are we going to rebuild so that we are stronger? How will we equip ourselves to see the signs of the times today and in these days, in these weeks and in these years, in our own lives and in the church, in this place? We need to be alert to what we are seeing and hearing. We need to be drawn into the word of God and recognise whether our words, whether our phrases, whether our stories that resonate with us. What is God saying through these? Where do we see God at work today? We see people rising up against injustice. As we recognise today some of the contributions of some of the lowest paid people in our society. Things are shifting as we recognise the value of these people. We couldn't have done this season without them. Where the words of Jesus said, love your neighbour as yourself. That reality is being realised today as neighbours get to know one another and come to rely on one another. In the signs of the times today, we can see God's upside down, God's topsy-turvy kingdom at work. We pray your kingdom come, but are we seeing the signs of it here? So as you go into this new week, look for those signs in this week, in every part of your life. Let's help one another to interpret them as we see how God is repurposing us, his children in this time, to repurpose us, to rebuild us for what is to come. Should we be excited or scared? Well, probably a little bit of both and a few other things besides but I want to see what God is building in this time and I'm excited to know what will be happening. So let's get on our knees if we need to this week and say sorry. Let's raise our arms in prayer, in praise where we need to. Let's spend some time with God reading his word and thinking what is that saying to us today? Let's communally reflect on all of this to help each other understand. And then let's act on what we are hearing as we see the signs of the times today. Amen. So we're going to move into a time of reflection now. And following this, Fran will lead our prayers. Loving God, whose touch can heal the broken places of life, heal us today. God of peace, whose spirit of peace can quiet our spirits of confusion and despair, reassure us today. Forgiving God, whose call to repentance promises grace upon grace, place your mercy in our souls today. You heal the sick and liberate the imprisoned, who bring justice in the midst of oppression, strength in the midst of weakness. Pour out your spirit of power upon us today. Open our hearts to new faithfulness. Redirect our waywardness and hold us gently in your goodness. We confess our need to you and we turn to you with hearts filled with hope, remembering the promises you have made to us. May your name be glorified in us and through us. We ask it through Christ Jesus, your only begotten Son is our Lord and our Savior, our brother and our friend. Amen. God Almighty, your goodness reaches the heavens and beyond. 
your faithfulness stretches to all the earth. Your mercy abounds in all places. There is nowhere we can turn that your forgiveness has not touched. Your grace surrounds us, encompasses us. Your kingdom is our present and our future hope. Give us the peace that passes all understanding, that we may embody your love to the world. We stand before you this morning, Lord, knowing you, who lived and died for us, see all that is in our hearts, our hopes, our worries, our sadness and joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray for the church worldwide, for us all, whether ordained ministers or members of a congregation. For worshippers used to being in a church building and for whom the current situation is painful and worrying. For free thinkers, leading others into different ideas of how to worship. For those of us for whom this is a barren desert and for those who see new opportunities to walk with Christ in helping others and changing the public face of Christianity. We pray for comfort in an unknown future for joy in serving you as opportunities present themselves and for a time when we can all worship together. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray for our world where the virus overwhelms health and hospital networks and resources, where economies are spiralling into chaos with the threat of unemployment and hunger. We pray for the politicians tasked with difficult decisions and for communities where disagreement and fear are causing unrest and disregard of personal safety. Give us all patience to follow guidelines and to use our common sense to weather the storm and store up our strength to move onwards and upwards when the pandemic has run its course. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray for our community, for those we know who are working hard to help others at this time, for the Parish Council, our food bank, and for the NHS and other frontline workers caring for and putting first other families before their own. We thank you for those helping neighbours and total strangers where they can, and for the smiles and greetings exchanged at a distance as we walk round the village. We pray for all those who are enduring lockdown because of health or age issues and who are missing their families and their familiar routines. We pray that the new technologies helping us to keep in contact will continue to inspire us to cement new friendships as well as to build on old ones and bring some hope of a return to a newer, brighter normal in a not too distant future. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray for all who are suffering at this time, those who are ill, grieving, worried, lonely or feeling hemmed in. We pray for refugee camps everywhere and for all the charities assisting where they can, locally and internationally. We pray for those looking after family or friends who are ill and whose lives are affected by changed routines or decreased mobility. Help us to learn lessons from improvised solutions which may improve housing, medical communication and work practices and to build on experience with enthusiasm. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray for ourselves that we may each find a way to look forward with patience and fortitude, to plan how to rebuild our lives and improve them. Show us how to discard the things that really do not matter and to nurture the things that will redefine us as your people. Our church building may not be easy for us to access at the moment, 
but our church family is communicating, praying and looking after each other. Help us to use our experiences to revitalise our worship, empower ourselves to go out into the community and be generous and welcoming to those who have yet to know your love. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you to Fran for our prayers this morning. And it's always lovely to see so many people in our service, in our readers, in the people that do our intercessions, and those that have sent in Lord's prayers. We've come to the end of all of our Lord's prayers now. Uh, so if you would like to do a Lord's prayer yourself, then please just record that and send it to us. We would love to include that in our service. And people really appreciate seeing one another because that is one of the biggest things that we are missing in this season. As you go into this week, I pray that you have a really good week, whatever you are doing. Can I just encourage you to be excited about what God is doing? These times are difficult, these times get us down hugely, but can I invite you to just trust in a God who is faithful, to look at the signs that are going on around you and in you, and we start to interpret those together to know where God is taking us to. So whatever you are doing in this week, I pray that you have a great week, and let us pray together as we walk into this week. Loving God, we thank you for all that you give to us. We thank you that you are always with us, no matter what the times or the seasons, you never leave us. In this time, we give you thanks for all that you are doing in us and through us, through this building, through our church community and through Yaxley. Father, help us to be wise. Help us to pick up on those things that you are saying to us, to act on those and help us in every season, in every situation of life, to praise you. So as we go into this week, may you know God's blessing with you. May you know the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. And may you follow the example of Jesus Christ, who walked that road before us. Have a great week and continue to stay safe. We move into our final song. Blessed be your name. Okay, let's bless the name of the Lord in this place today. One voice, one choir, coming before one God, one name above every name, one throne. Blessed be the name.
your glorious name, Jesus. Blessed be your name on the road with suffering. Oh, it's pain. Every blessing now, every blessing. 